Um, they're for the graduates. Good song. Good song. Hey, no one sent any songs in yet. New songs for our song night. Just ideas, no promises, but. Well, no, send them ahead so we can put them on Planning Center. We're not that cold, like, hey, first time you've ever heard this, go. Except last time we did one, that's what we did. It worked out. They just give them a thumbs up. Good morning, everybody, and welcome. Are you all excited to be here? I am. I cannot wait to worship. So would you stand with us? I have a scripture that's been on my heart all week that I wanted to read as we get started. You probably know it. It's from Matthew chapter 11. Here's what it says. Come to me. All you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we can come to you and just lay our burdens at the cross. We thank you for your love. We thank you that there is nothing that you do not know already. So this morning, as we get ready to worship, I pray that we would just come to you with all of our burdens, unashamedly. So whatever that is, God, that we would just come to you and spend time with you. And we thank you that you wait for us with open arms, that we can come and just be with you. Father, we thank you for your love. In Jesus' name. Let's sing this.
Christ be praised today. All our hope is in you. All our peace is in you. All our joy is in you. Our salvation, our life, our light. All these words that we have said in these first two songs are all found in you. And they find their fullness in you, their perfection in you. So thank you for even being sufficient in your descriptions that you are a joyful God, a, a God of peace, a God of abundance. So Jesus, we praise you and you alone today. We sing our praises to you. We engage our minds 
in pursuit of you in our thoughts, our voices, our actions. All of us, Jesus, in response to your goodness to us. You wouldn't let me stay a captive. You couldn't stand to see my chains. And so you came to be my rescue. To part the waters in my way. In Jesus, Jesus, you are my deliverance from death to life from dark to light Jesus you show me what freedom is you call my name and you broke my shame you are my deliverance you alone my deliverance You wouldn't let me stay in charge You took the wrath that I deserve Your outstretched songs became my rescue Save us Your blood
sing his love. Your love defeated the enemy. Your love is now there's no looking back. Your love defeated the enemy. Your love defeated the enemy. Now there is victory ahead of me. There's no looking back. No looking back. You are able to save to the uttermost, Jesus. There was none too far off. None too lost, none too broken. God, your grace is sufficient for all. So thank you for being victorious, for being our hero, our champion, our victor, Jesus, that we can rest in, that we're saved by, that we can now walk in life and in light with hope in the midst of a world that is so dark and so hopeless. You are good to us. You are kind to us in countless ways. So Jesus, you told us that your heart is gentle and lowly. And your work on the cross was one of strength and power. And the fact that you walked out of a tomb says you have all authority. So it's in your name we pray. In your presence, we rest. We close this time of just singing our worship to you, just simply by saying thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. You can have a seat. Good morning, Catalyst Church. How are we doing today? Good. Uh, I'm Andrew. I'm the uh, youth pastor here, and I'm so excited that you guys are here. Uh, if it's your first time, I just want to welcome you all, and I want to let you know that here at Catalyst, we're all about knowing Christ and making Him known, right? Uh, and if that's too simple, and you don't know what that really means, uh, we have this thing called Discover Catalyst on June 26th, and that's a time, if you're new, to be able to sit across the table and ask the questions of who we are at Catalyst. Um, you can sign up for that. Uh, another couple things we have coming up is a men's and women's Bible study. Uh, the men's is called Wild at Heart. The women's is called Captivating. You want to sign up for that. Uh, it's going to be a great time to just dive in deeper and just, just learn more, right? That's, that's what it's all about. Um, and then summer Sundays, I'm excited about because I get to throw water balloons at people. I mean, I, I don't know what else we're doing. Uh, but you can sign up for that. It's for your family. Uh, come out June 12th. You want to sign up for that. There's going to be food, games. I'm going to hit you with water balloons. Again, why, why, why not come to that? Uh, and then if you're wondering uh, what, what's up with that new homeschooled family that parked out front, how do, how do I get to park there? Uh, no, that's our new church van. Uh, super excited about that. Uh, so you want to be able to stop, check that out, uh, just take a good look at it. I mean, it is so amazing to see what God did, right? Uh, I mean, that is just, it's so when it was parked outside and rolled up, I was like, man, God is so good, right? Um, and then the series that we're doing today is uh, Nate and Monica are going to come up, and we're doing Abiding Family. What does that look like? Questions. Um, but it's not too late to ask questions. If you said, oh, I forgot, um, the number will be up on the screen periodically. Um, just text that over, and we'll get the questions to him about, hey, I got a question. It's not too late. Um, abiding Family. That's what moves me into my next... The reason I'm up here is we're going we're gonna to celebrate our grads today, right? And um, so if Allie would come up and join me. Uh, and while she's joining me... Uh, I just have a couple things I want to say. There's three prayer points I want to talk about today. At the end, we're going to pray for our grads. And one is, obviously, for the grads. The second one is for the parents, right? We're going to pray for the parents because they're moving into a new season that maybe looks a little different. Um, and in our culture, this thing of like, uh, hey, when they hit 18, they're done, right? But God is the perfect example of what a father is. And I'm so glad that God doesn't say when I hit 18, hey, I'm done with you. Right? And so they're moving into a new season that's going to look different. They talked about it in first service up front. Um, and so we're just going to pray for them because maybe they've had a kid that's graduated, maybe they hadn't. But every kid is so unique and so different. And so it's going to look different for every kid that graduates and move on. And then the third one is you guys sitting in here today. You don't get away from what does it look like to be a part of this. We, grew, we uh, dedicated kids last week. 
um, and you said, hey, I'm here to support them. When they hit 18, we're still there to support them. And so I want to pray, what does that look like, this new season as they move forward? How do we continue to support the parents and the graduates? Um, and so if I could have our first grad come down, Allison, if you could come on down. Allie, come on down. Give it up for her. Yay! Our next one is Holland. Stay on down here. Try to get away. Next one is Ben. And Daniel. And Cassie. And we got two that I don't think are here today. So we got Emily Clark and Jacqueline Ledbetter. Um, I don't think they're here with us today. Who else we got? Kenny! Come on down! All right. Uh, so at this time, can I have elders, deacons, youth leaders, parents, if you would, uh, if you're in the room, if you would join us down front, we're going to pray for them. Um, it's such an important thing for us to do. Uh, so I'll give us a moment for everyone to come on down. If the rest of the congregation would stand with me, because prayer is something that you just don't sit there and listen. It's something that you're going to be a part of, right? Uh, so if you would, as a sign of faith that you're praying with us, if you could reach out your hands towards, towards these youth kids. Um, don't be shy. Don't be shy. <clears throat> All right, if you would pray for us, pray with us. Father, we just thank you so much for this group that's standing here. We thank you that um, you've brought them this far. That's what we're celebrating is how you brought them this far, but this is a launching to their next season. God, that you're not done with them yet. You, you have plans for them. You have a purpose for them, and they're just going to begin to find out what that is in this season. As they move forward, as they graduate, as they, maybe they stay home, maybe they go to school, no matter what it is, you have the plan, you have the purpose, and all they need to do is come and seek your face to see what you have for them. That's what's so amazing about you, about having that abiding relationship, is that we don't have to do this alone, Lord, that you are a source that we can go to to find direction, to find path. And we just thank you so much for that. And we pray in this season that they uh, continue to have other people, leaders, adults, uh, that gather around them to lift them up, to pray for them, that they know that they are not alone, that they have people that have poured into to them, that have been praying for them, um, and will continue to pray for them. God, and now we lift up their parents. This is new. Maybe they've been through this before with another, another kid, but, but every kid is so uniquely gifted, called, and every parent has to love and guide differently for each kid. And so we just continue. We pray for them. We pray that you would guide them in everything they say and everything they do as they move into this new season, God. And we thank you that you are the parent that lets us know. God, you've shown us that we, we are, even though we continue to grow and get old, Lord, that you're still there for us. And so I just pray that these parents would continue to show up as they have, God, that we continue to be faithful to guide and to lead as you've called them as parents. God, and the last people I want to talk to is this congregation out here. God, that, that these seniors, they, they're graduating, they're moving into a new thing, and I know they may look cooler than what we think we look like. Maybe they have cooler clothes than we, but God, but they, are just, they are just like us, Lord. God, they're trying to figure this thing out called life. They're on a journey, and we're a part of that journey. You've been called here at Catalyst Church to help facilitate their journey, to help guide them, to help give direction, God, to just be there. And so we just pray for this congregation to continue to lift up these seniors, to lift up these parents. God, and we just, we just give this whole day to you. We thank you for everything that you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Will you guys find your seats? Uh, last thing, real quick, I forgot to mention, the gift that we gave them, if you're wondering what's in the bag, is as leadership here at Catalyst, as our youth leaders, we took the time to pray and to write inside of journaling Bibles for these kids. Uh, as a staff, as a leadership, we passed it around, and we just took the time to pray, and so that is what we gave them. Um, parents, there's a letter in there that I wrote to you guys, and so I'd encourage you to read that. And so uh, we just believe that the Bible is such an important thing, um, and so that's why we wanted to give that to them as they move into this next season uh, with encouragements and things from the leaders here. Um, so again, I'll ask you to stand.
I know, I got you. You're fooled. Uh, reach across the aisle, move around, and say hello to somebody that maybe you haven't said hello to before. Good morning, Catalyst. Doing things a little different today. My name is Nate. This is Monica. And uh, a few few months ago, we were talking through the Timothy series. And uh, after Monica's talk, we thought about this this uh, uh, abiding family conversation. And just to do this, it kind of took took uh, flight. And we've had a ton of questions come in. If you have some questions, you can still text those. Uh, we'll try to get to as many as we can. If we don't get to some of your questions, uh, reach back out. And if you want to sit down with the pastor or leader, we want to process these with you guys. Uh, we're excited about this. We are a family that's trying to figure it out like everybody else. These answers, many of them are so gray. Um, we can point to the Bible, but some of them are just the way we do it that may be right or wrong for your family. There are other things that are very clear in Scripture that we're going to try to promote as best we can. But ultimately, like Monica said last week, which, by the way, uh, phenomenal feedback from so many in the congregation. Yes. And um, I've been asked by multiple people, when is she up again? And when am I stepping into the second position? And all that stuff. Uh, I ask her all the time to speak. It's, it's on her. So pray that the Holy Spirit just sick her and that she gets miserable until she says yes, uh, because she just has a way of leading and teaching. And so I appreciate her uh, saying yes to this. Uh, but we are not the perfect family by any means. Uh, we'll tell you that. Uh, our kids are not perfect. Our kids have been through ups and downs and battles, but that's what's made them uh, who they are today. Uh, and these are habits. They're not principles, ABCs. They're habits that you can implement in different stages of your life. Again, it's not just do step one, two, and three. They're principles and habits. So, uh, babe, do you have anything before we dive in? All right, why don't you open us with the... Uh, the legacy, lineage, Second Timothy conversation. Sure. I read this last week, and this is just a few more verses, but Second Timothy 1, 5 through 7. When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. I think that's really important for a family conversation. Yeah, <laughs> and the fact that, remember, you see three generations here. Uh, matter of fact, uh, Timothy's father was a Greek. He was non-believing, and so you have a strong matriarchy of the, a grandmother, a mother, and then Timothy, and you see God being able to use Timothy because of the upbringing in the things of God. I think it's important to notice that. I think it's vitally important to notice that at the end, well, it's not the end of the the, the chapter there, but he, he piggybacks all of that together, and then he says, for God has not given you a spirit of fear. When it comes to families, when it comes to things like this, I, the amount of parents that ask us questions, and then they're just like, we're afraid. We're terrified. Like, we don't want to make the wrong choices, and how do we go about this? We don't want to screw our kids up. That's kind of common language. We've said the same thing, and so we have to recognize God empowers us, you know, as believers in Jesus, as abiders in Christ. And I heard this quote a few, uh, I heard a quote that I'm going to twist and, and fit my the way that I, that I want it, but it was in a business perspective. And he said, within a relationship, you can define a priority by the responsibility that you give to it. 
Within a relationship, you can define a priority by the responsibility you give to it. So you can say, I'm a dad, and I'm a father, and I'm a husband, and you can say all day these things about your responsibilities, but we see the priority based on, or we see how true that is in your life based on how much priority you put on that. So look at my life as a husband to Monica, a father to my kids, a pastor to Catalyst. If I go off six days a week and then preach one sermon a week, you can say that I don't put a high priority on my job at Catalyst Church. I don't put a high priority on my kids and my wife. It's the fact of we should see this modeled in your life to where if you're saying yes to certain things that get in the way of your family, get in the way of discipleship, then you really don't put a high priority in. So the, 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 as we process through some of this today, ask the, ask the Lord to speak to your heart. What, what are the things that I might think I'm putting good priorities on? What are the things that I, I am really putting those priorities on? And I think that was just a good way to set all that up. All right, so let's dive into these. See if we got any new ones yet. Nope, no, no new questions. So we'll just jump into these. How do you reconcile two conflicting parenting styles? Monica, she's the genius. She's the wisdom. She's... Um, When I read that question, I thought, well, first of all, that's pretty common to have two conflicting parenting styles because you have generally in a relationship two conflicting personalities. Um, It just seems the opposites attract. And um, we certainly do have conflicting personalities, conflicting parenting styles. You couldn't get more opposite than Nate and myself. Um, But I see that actually as a benefit because our kids get perspective from both of us. They get the strengths and weaknesses that come from both of our personalities. And if we are wise and we work together for the same goal, which is teaching our children to abide in Christ and to pursue Jesus, then that actually works for you. Mm -hmm. So I think what's really important is to keep it, even if your your parenting style is different, that you have the same goal. There it is, yeah. And one of the things that we've always said is... um, if our kids ask for permission for something or do something and one of us feels yes and one of us feels no, we always go with the no because it's easier to come back and say, you know what, we've thought about it and talked about it and we've changed our mind and we're going to allow this than it is to allow it and then bring it back. That's not to say that you can't. If you have been doing something for a while, you've been allowing something for a while and you kind of feel convicted on it and you feel like the Lord's saying, hey, that's not really right for you. That's not healthy for your kid. It is okay to go back and say, hey, I know we've allowed this, but the more we've thought about it, the more we've researched it, we don't really feel like that's Mm -hmm. the right decision, so we're going to stop. And I always use the analogy of spoiled milk. If you go to the refrigerator and you take the jug of milk out of the refrigerator and you chug it, first of all, Shame on you. No. <laughs> Get a glass. No, um, but if you, you start to it. drink it and you realize, oh, it's sour, do you keep drinking it or do you stop and you spit it out and don't drink anymore? Yeah, that's so, um, so it's the, the same concept applies. Because I've just heard parents say, well, we've been doing it, we've been allowing it, and now I don't know how to, you know, how to go back. Well, you go back and it's going to, might take some work, you mm-hmm. might have to uproot some things, but it's okay. Um, especially yeah. if you feel like that's harmful for your and kids. And that's one of the things you even talked about last week, having humility mm-hmm. as parents to say we messed it up, we made a mistake, yeah. you know, and uh, apologizing for it. Or we just thought about it and we feel like we're going in a different direction. Yeah. Uh, I love what you said, just the um, use it to your advantage. Yeah. As long as you're on the same page with the vision, you know, and the goals, you can, you can utilize that together. Yeah. Conflicting. Try, not to, try not to do good cop, bad cop. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, kids because are kids are really smart and yeah. they will use that against you. And they know which parent to come to. Not any Sweeney kids, of course. Of course not, yeah. <laughs> All right, is the woman supposed to run the home? So this one we talked through, and we, we, you know, the, we, we kind of lean towards what we think it means uh, because of cultural Christianity. Um, and so we're going to take it from that perspective, but uh, we don't know exactly what they mean by is the woman supposed to run the home. But traditionally, you know, you've got extreme evangelicalism. Uh, and where it's, you know, the woman's job is at home. We've had people approach us and say, look, it's, it's against scripture for the woman to work outside the home. And we've said, chapter and verse, man, where are you coming from with this? And uh, you, culturally, that might be what you grew up in, but that's not biblical. And so a lot of people point to 
places in Timothy and Titus about, you know, how they define womanhood and all that, which we're going to get into in our Did God Really Say series. But uh, I always point people to the Proverbs 31 woman because a lot of people will point people to that, right? And they'll say, I want a Proverbs 31 woman. And when I was a teenager, all the guys in youth group were writing out their, their vision for their future spouse. And Proverbs 31 came up a lot. Well, if you read all of Proverbs 31, Number one, most theologians believe it's not speaking about one woman. It's speaking about some characteristics. Proverbs are principles, right? They're not just A, B, and C. But secondly, the woman in Proverbs was a leader, and she was a businesswoman, and she was an entrepreneur, and she made things at home and sold them in the marketplace. Like, that is a woman leader. Like, I don't understand where this whole mindset of, you know, barefoot and pregnant, I mean, I get where it comes from, but it's not the biblical mindset. And so is the woman supposed to run the home? That's between you guys. There are very black and white in scripture, but one of the things we talk about is how many um, men over the years have just, you know, sat with me and said, I feel, you know, emasculated because my wife runs the numbers in our house. And I'm like, well, why do you feel that way? And why does she run the numbers? Well, I screwed up every time. So you're not gifted with numbers. Why is that emasculating? Like, why in the world would that be? That makes no sense to me. So there's these mindsets that men are supposed to do and women are supposed to do. And you figure that out in your own home and and run with that and just pick and choose what that looks like. Monica, typically at our house, she, in the quotes, runs our home in the sense of she takes care of the day-to-day stuff. She takes care of the homeschool, the meals. Uh, but I'm, I'm a part of the cleaning crew many times. I'm a part of the, I have my chore list, right? She delegates chores to me. You let your wife tell you what to do? Absolutely, in many ways. She's good at it. And I know I'm a list guy. Give me a list and I'll be happy to do it. Well, some men don't like that. And so is the woman supposed to run the home? Some women, they don't, they don't want to do those types of things. Or if it's a uh, both of them are working, and then you come home, and the man sits and drinks his, you know, his beverage on the on the couch watching TV, and the woman does everything else. Like, where does that come from? It's not biblical. It might be cultural, and so you've got to figure that out within your own home. Yeah. Got anything to that? Yeah. Another example is sometimes men are better cooks. Like, just because it's a woman doesn't mean she has to make the dinner, right? Oh, there you go. I mean, some of y'all can like really lay out a good meal. Um, also, when I read Proverbs 31, I kind of just wish I could just be barefoot and pregnant. <laughs> that girl is busy. That girl is busy. So uh, that's really all I had to say about that. Yeah. Again, that's... <laughs> I don't know if she's asking or what, but it's, uh, I got that look. Okay, well, we can consider that. Um, how, do we, how do we speak to our teens about dating and biblical purity? So Monica had some great thoughts around this, and I'm going to piggyback off of her. Um, what does the Bible say about dating? It doesn't. There's no dating in the Bible. That's a shocker to a lot of people. Um, there's no dating in the Bible. There's a lot of marriage and there's a lot of courtship. There's betrothal. a lot of betrothal. But there is just no serial dating. It's not there. You won't find it. And it's because God thinks so highly of marriage and relationship and family um, that it's not something to be entered into lightly. He cares about people. Um so that's what the Bible says about dating. Um, how have we handled that? How do we speak to our teens? How do we about speak it? to our teens about Biblically dating? and purity. Yeah. Um, one of the things that we we teach our kids about dating is first of all, be friends because you don't want to marry someone that you can't get along with, that you're not even friends with. Um, especially when you're younger, you're either gonna break up or you're gonna get married. That's just how it goes. And so if you're not of age to where you can get married, what's really the point in pursuing a relationship to the extent that our culture, you know, presents it? Um, And also uh, something that's really important is to leave people better than you found them. That's one of the things that we talk to our kids. If you're going to be in a relationship with someone, if it doesn't work out, if, if you have older teens and they are thinking, you know, on that track, still, that is someone else's wife or someone else's husband. That's one of the things that we, we teach them. And to leave people better than you found them. And, you know, you want people to walk away from a relationship with you better people mm-hmm. rather than someone that's broken. I remember reading a quote one time that said, I'm raising a son that your daughter won't have to heal from. Mm. And so the same can be said for daughters, because daughters can be, I mean, girls can be brutal when it comes to that kind of stuff, too. We want to raise kids that other people don't have to heal from. Right. It's good. 
And in speaking to culture, uh, we were talking a couple years ago with our kids about even just the, uh, the sitcoms that they were watching and Disney stuff, and not, not Disney specifically, but you know that type of uh, teenager stuff. And I mean, the majority of these little kids, 12, 13 years old, are just loss of identity because they're not dating anybody. And it talked about it over and over, got to get a boyfriend, got to get a girlfriend, or I'm in love with you, and they kiss, and they make out, and they do all these things, and then two weeks later, they're in love with somebody else. And uh, most young kids aren't emotionally ready to date. And so culture says you're not enough if you don't have, and the Bible says you are enough because of Christ. And so that speaks to the singleness, which we're not going to have time to really dive into, but many people don't view singleness as a gift. It is a gift from God. Even Paul said, hey, it's better you remain single. You can do more work for the Lord. If he's called you to be married, great, but if not, like, like there's this huge jump between you know, singleness and marriage, and we got to just be careful to allow the Bible to speak, not culture, the loudest. Also, this purity conversation, we've had years of conversation around. We grew up in, in the, the, the purity culture, quote unquote, uh, our age group, uh, the kiss, date, and goodbye stuff. And, you know, in my, in my upbringing, it was you just couldn't have sex before marriage. But I mean, most of my friends were doing everything up to the line, right? And so it wasn't about purity, it was about just the rules and regulations, doing as much as we can without. I had a lot of friends that I knew that got married just because, hey, I want to have sex, and so I can only have sex inside of marriage because that's God's way. And then the marriage imploded. They got divorced. Like, think about the, the damage we're doing and the fact that we've talked a lot about, you know, we were always taught that, you know, you give yourself away to this one, and you pluck a flower, and you give it one away, and you pluck a petal off the flower, and before you know it, you don't have any petals left to give to your spouse. And it was this damaged goods mindset, and, and I'm going... Jesus is a redeemer that gives you a new flower. Like, why, why does it have to be that we're, you know, we're so, so high on this? If you've done this, it's almost like the scarlet letter, unpardonable sin. Now, pause. The Bible is very clear about human sexuality, which we're going to address when we get into our Did God Really Say series. And the standard is what it is. We're not saying just, just go be free with all of that. There is biblical standards. But God is a redeemer, and so we have to look at it from if it's a purity in heart conversation or a purity in action conversation. And even the abortion conversation that's coming on the scene, a lot of people are picking that back up, you know, knowing people in the past that when they kept the baby, they were scarlet lettered as a church. The church, oh, she's damaged goods, where she could have just gone and got the abortion, knowing people that said, I got an abortion because I didn't want to be the scarlet letter at church. So if we're going to be pro-life, let's be pro-life. Let's, we talked years ago about, thank you, we talked years ago and we put in our budget child care for youth group and people freaked out. What? We're just going to encourage all the girls to go get pregnant. That's what you hear when you hear that? No, we know that girls are getting pregnant out of wedlock and we want to say we value life and you kept the baby, so we're going to love you, we're going to encourage you and we're going to do everything we can to support that. That does not encourage this behavior over here in the least bit. It's still a standard. So we got to be careful when we're talking to teens and dating and biblical impurity. Let's have grace at the conversation where truth, absolutely. Monica said it last week. Grace plus truth equals love. And so I think that's one that just really gets muddied up a lot in the church. And I didn't, didn't mean to get preaching there. So no, that's, that's good. Um, I love the conversation about purity. And I think it's so important how we talk to our kids on that and that it's something that is a continued conversation. Um, we've always encouraged our children to stay sexually pure because that's, that is what the Bible says. But it's so much bigger yeah. than just sexual intercourse. Exactly. It's so much bigger than that. Um, the Bible tells us that our righteousness is like filthy rags. So there's nothing that you can do or your kids can do or can't do that makes them pure. That happens through the blood of Jesus. Amen. And it's such a big conversation. It's such a big conversation to talk about biblical purity and what that really is. Yeah. The blood of Jesus makes us pure. And the reason why that's important is because when your kids mess up, and they will, they're going to. even if it's not sexually, they're going to mess up. Do they, are you creating an environment? Are you creating a relationship to where they can come to tell you, Mom, like, I messed up. I got carried away. This happened. I was in this situation. and Or 
Are we creating an environment that shames them into silence, that shames them into going to an abortion clinic? Because it's easier to go do that than to live with that shame over their heads yeah. their entire life. Um, Amen. And we know that in, you know, in, in other religious, and we've just known that it's, that's been the, the end all be all. That's been the unpardonable sin is sexual sin, and I don't know where we get that from. Uh And so then kids don't want to, they don't want to talk about it. And so I think that that conversation, it's just a big conversation. It's not, you're not just one and done with that. You need to keep those lines of communication open. Keeping it open so that the the analogy we've used is I sin, your your son sins. Does he say, my dad's going to be mad at me. I'm I'm ashamed. I'm going to not talk to my dad. Or does he run into dad's room and say, dad, I'm so sorry, but I, I sinned, and my heart's broken, but I know that there's grace, and I know there's forgiveness, and I know you're upset with me. I know you're disappointed, but I know you're going to forgive me. See, which, which parenting style is going to lead them to the, to the cross? And it really, the it really, how we approach that can really speak to how we see their worth and what we think their worth is tied up yeah. in. And if we are shaming them for any sin, any sin, then we're saying their worth is attached to their works, so good, and yeah. that's not what the Bible says. Their worth is attached to Jesus Christ. Amen. And again, we could talk on a lot of these for quite a while. The next one, I did not grow up in the church. My husband did after some incredibly, di- I don't know why I'm choking up, but incredibly difficult moments in our lives, I decided I need to lean into God, and my husband started to lose faith. So, so picture this. There's this dichotomy going on. We're attending together with our children in hopes to have a stronger relationship with God, our marriage, and family. I still feel like I don't know how to bring more of it home. I don't want to just be a, a Sunday attender, I don't, uh, but I feel lost where to start. I don't know how to pray, so I don't even know how to teach my children. Uh, number one, thank you. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for asking that question. And the answer that I have, and she can speak to what she wants, but I don't want to make it sound just simple and easy, okay? But, 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 but my answer is... Yes, keep doing what you're doing. All of us are at a starting point at some point and ask the questions. And we have a phenomenal, you mentioned kids. I don't know if they're children age or, or teenage age, but the, the resources we have here, we want to partner with you. And so we send home resources every week so you can learn with your kids. You know, you can disciple them as you're being discipled. And, and whoever the husband, the spouse here, challenge your faith. Thank you for that. Like this is a safe place. If you're struggling with your faith, you know, a lot of churches I grew up, you don't get that. Like, you just believe it. Belong, you want to belong here, you believe this. No, struggle with your faith. Ask the questions. Sit with the pastor. You know, ask the tough questions. Tell somebody you're struggling with your faith and get it out. And, and also, uh, this is one that I, I, I never, I, don't, I wasn't the, the smart one behind this, but uh, we've, we've had over the years a lot of parents who were um, newer in the Lord. They don't really know much, but they wanted to help in children's. So they serve in children's, and they're actually learning as they teach. So you get to actually be the teacher. You're the big person in the room, but you're learning it as you teach it. And we have had so many parents say, I am, I'm loving this because I am growing in my faith. So that's a simple place to start. You know, you're, you're just going there. You're serving, but our Kidman team is so amazing to give you the resources yourself. And so please just keep showing up. If you want to meet with the Kidman leaders or, or youth ministry or an adult leader, just Sit with us because we're so proud of you for having the conversation, and it's definitely not easy. And so we've all been there at some point. I'm there in some ways in my faith. I'm going back to, man, I feel like I'm just starting. Lord exposed some things in my life recently, and I'm like, I feel like I'm starting over in some areas. I thought I was past that. And so please let us encourage you to keep keep showing up. Yeah. Did you have anything with that? Yeah, we do seem to try to overcomplicate it a lot of times, I think, when really we're all just in process. We're all in different places. You're never going to get to this place where you're like, oh, I've arrived. Um, that's heaven. Yeah. You know, um, and, and what is it, then. <laughs> what is it? The Bible says that unless you have faith, like a, like child. a child, um, what's the rest you of it? You can know mine's entered the kingdom of heaven. That's the, yeah, you, you know, you don't get into heaven. And so once again, you see how much God values children so much that he's saying our faith should be like that of a little child. Simplistic. Um, simplistic. And if you don't know how to pray, just start. Just like what we heard in that song last week. What's on your heart? Mm-hmm. You know, just be honest with God. He can take it. Like, Lord, you know, this person mentioned um, some struggles that they were having, some really hard struggles. Talk to him about that. 
Tell him how you're feeling about that. Ask him, you know, to bring you some encouragement, to show you some encouragement. Yeah. Um, and get involved in community. Yeah. You know, there are people here that love you, that are, that are encouraging, you know, small group, whatever that looks like, men's and women's Bible studies. Uh, what is a biblical example of an emotionally healthy family? I thought this was one of the best questions. I wrestled with this for days, and I'm like, oh, that's a great question. So then I hand it off to Monica. <laughs> it's all you, babe. Uh, when I read that question, I thought, what's a biblical example of an emotionally healthy family? And immediately, I just thought of Joseph, Mary, and Jesus. And the reason why is because I thought of Mary, a young girl, who an angel appears to her and is like, hey, you're going to have a baby. It's going to be God. Um, and I you're a virgin. And yeah, <laughs> and you're a virgin. Um, and I can't imagine the emotions that came with that. And then she's got to go tell her fiancé, hey, I'm going to have a baby, and it's going to be God, and I promise I'm a virgin, <laughs> you know? And he's hearing that like, okay, yeah, in God's baby. Um, <laughs> and then the angel comes, it's like, no, really. So <laughs> there's just all these emotions mm -hmm. that are at play there, and they have to figure that out. They have to wrestle with that. That's our first, you know, I think Christian family that we see. Yeah. Um, and then Jesus comes on the scene, and um, basically they're, just, they're they're wrestling with the same emotional ups and downs that we yeah. do. And what I see is just honesty. Um, an yeah. example of a of an emotionally healthy family, a biblical example, is an emotionally honest family. That's good, yeah. I think being free to be you know honest about what you're feeling and your emotions so that you can deal with them in a healthy way yeah. because you can't deal with what you're not honest about. That's good. Uh, I appreciate that. I, I thought of Joseph as well because of the, the emotional way he processed. Immediately he thought, well, I'll, I'll put her away quietly. I'll divorce her because in that culture they were betrothed, but it meant they were already hitched, right? They were married at that point. It was just walking out the process. So even in that, he was having this, I'm not going to embarrass her. Jewish culture says call her out in front of the congregation. He wasn't going to do that. Um, and then how he processed. Then I thought of John. You, you see John being sort of healthy emotionally, you know, um, laying on the breast of Jesus. It was more of a cultural thing. I was at the men's retreat this week. I saw no guys laying on the breast of another guy. You know, it just, it wasn't a thing for American culture. But back then, John had that emotional relationship. Jesus even handed him off to, to the mother of Mary and said, hey, mother, son, son, mother. And so I think the picture for me is, is seeing, somebody asked me a few weeks ago, we got into it about a theological issue, and she was very much saying that, well, the Bible doesn't speak to that. And I said, it doesn't say, thus saith the Lord, ABC, but it speaks to it by pictures, by stories. And so I think we see um, emotions as being transparent and healthy. Look at Peter. We see what he did right and what he did wrong. Like, I'll go anywhere for you, Jesus. I'm going to deny you, Jesus. You know, I'll, you know you're not going to wash my feet. Oh, you're not, you wash my feet? You can wash all of me. You know, he was just this, but it was an honest picture, right, of who this person was, Paul and Peter. Like, they weren't best friends. Like, they got into it, and they, they had uh, healthy conflict. And a lot of people think conflict's unhealthy, but uh, emotionally healthy people have healthy conflict. And so I think that's, that's my answer is it's not one family that we watched our whole life. It's pictures throughout the Scripture that we can see. Yeah. Uh, this one, we were going to leave out because we're going to address some of this in the next series, but we decided to keep it in. Do we have, attend a family same-sex marriage wedding? Uh, how do we navigate this with our children? Um, how can I love someone who thinks there are more than two genders, think there should only be one gender in a relationship? And so uh, this is such a complex issue. We don't just, there's not a black and white, you know, answer that we just throw out there. But number one, um, I've just been shocked over the years how this, along with the, the, the sexual one that we already mentioned, like same-sex conversations, it's like the unpardonable sin. Like there's, it's just... We throw these people into a different class instead of saying they're made in the image of God and the biblical standard is this. Like it is one man, one woman for life, but yet we've put these people in a different class. And so we've got to open our eyes to the bigger picture. And I've asked people who are literally, you know, living in a non-married, you know, sexual relationship. They're living together, but they're not married. And they have the audacity to condemn somebody who's in a same-sex marriage. It's all porneia, folks. 
Somebody who's addicted to porn, that's porneia. Jesus said if you looked at a woman to lust after her, that's porneia. It's adultery. So why have we put this group of people in a class of their own rather than say, yes, they're sinning. It is sin. Catalyst doctrine, if you've not been through our doctrine. It is flat black, black and white sin, but how we approach that. And so we, our conversation with us, we've actually had these conversations in our family. Uh, number one, we have people that deal with same-sex attraction that aren't expressing it, living it out. We have people that are in full you know, expression of that. We, we will go to their birthday parties. We will go to events. We love them. They're in our life, right? We love them because they're people. But when we talk about a marriage, when you look at marriage, it is a covenantal thing. It is one man, one woman, biblically. And when I go to a marriage, a wedding, I am celebrating what God's doing. And, and God can't do that in a same-sex marriage. It's, it's just not the same. And so when the priest or the minister asks, does anyone have an objection? Are you going to go with an objection but not say anything? Or are you going to sit down and say, hey, we love you and we appreciate you. We're in your life, but we're just not going to say yes to this. And so we're still in your life and we still love you, but we're going to, to, to walk away from this exa- example right here. If it's a son or a daughter, now that's a personal conviction. Everybody's got their own. I've had one person say, well, they know where you stand already. Why are you going to boycott their wedding? It's not that I'm just boycotting their wedding. It's that I'm not putting my stamp on something that God has told me not to put my stamp on. Just like as a pastor, I have pastor friends that will marry anybody. Wait, they're living together and they want to get married. So go marry them tomorrow so they're not in sin. No, 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 no. Marriage is sacred to me, and it's one man, one woman for life. I'm not a hired gun. I'm going to sit down and make sure they go through premarital. I'm going to ask them to not be in the same home for six months to a year. I'm going to ask them to not live together, to cut off the sexual relations. That's how I go about it, because marriage is sacred. And so we've got to go back and say, if God created something sacred, I'm not going to water it down for any reason. And so that's how I think. That's how I've taken my stance is how that works. But at the same time, the gender conversation, if you are not, if you're a parent of a teenager or a young person and you're not talking about same-sex conversations and transgender and gender euphoria and all this stuff, then you are so far behind. I'm not being critical. I'm saying your kids are learning this. They're hearing about it. Their peer groups are talking about it. We have a a ministry family. We homeschool. Uh, They go to youth group. They go to Christian co-op. And our kids will say stuff and we're like, this is years ago, where did you hear that from? Like, they're getting these influences, and so we need to have biblical responses and not just, oh, we don't hang around with those people. Or the question, and I don't mean whoever wrote this, how do I love someone who believes there's two genders? You love them like Jesus would love them. You love them like you would love somebody who believes there's, you know, one man, one woman for life. They're they're human beings. Like, why would you ask that you have to love them differently? Now, how do you live that out in relationship? That's a whole other conversation. You can talk about biology and and science, and you can get into all of that. Do your research and cite your sources. Don't just beat a pulpit, you know, and say the Bible says so. Get into their world. Love them. Encourage them and have the conversations, and maybe you can be the one that loves them uh, out of that. We call it loving the hell out of people, right? There's hell in them, and we love them so much that we can love the hell out of them. Like, it's a beautiful picture of transformation. I talked with somebody just today who's got a family member that has just been coming to Catalyst, and God is transforming this individual. Over a years of pe- period of years, I knew none of this, and he's quit all of these lifestyle, negative lifestyle choices, and he's studying his Bible for the first time in his life. Like, life transformation, not because we beat him with the Bible, because we sat down across the table, and we just loved him where he was in his lifestyle choices, if that makes sense. So uh, I don't know if I've said too much, too little, but... Yep. I'm passionate about this. I very much, I grew up in an environment where homosexuality was just the unpardonable sin, and, and, and we, didn't, we didn't evangelize. So we'll talk about that in our next series. Moving on to the next one, you good? Yeah. All right. Um, how do we navigate? No, yeah, yeah we'll go there. Uh, how do we navigate? Now, let's just jump to the next one. What, what do family devos look like for your home? Should you? How long? How often? What setting? What does bedtime look like? Prayer, scriptures, memory, just listening. Uh, for ours, it's been an evolution uh, I'll let Monica kick that off, but it's been, it's evolved over the years with different ages. And Yeah. Um, what does it look like for our home and should you? Yes, you should. Um, you should do something. You should be intentional about discipling your kids, however that looks. And it looks different for everyone. For us, it started off at bedtime singing and praying. We started that with Emma when it was just her and carried that on with the other two. 
And what he means by it's evolved is when they were younger and everybody was home at the same time, it was a lot easier to just, okay, at 8 o'clock we do sing and pray. And But now that, um, you know, as they got older and got jobs and social lives and things like that, it was a lot harder to facilitate that, you know, at the same time. And we, we tried, and we still try to aim for the same thing. But um, so we would just, our, ours kind of looked like we would sit around um, in the living room starting out, just everybody had a turn picking out a song and praying. And so the song had to be a Jesus song is what we call it. Um, and so that person would pick the song and then they would pray. And we would go around and do prayer requests and they, so they would pray for whatever prayer requests we had. Mm-hmm. And that really got our kids praying in a comfortable, you know, getting just in a safe environment, feeling comfortable yeah. praying. And some still feel more comfortable than others yeah. with prayer, and that's totally okay. Yeah. So that's kind of how we started it, and then it's evolved even into um, we'll just go into their room separately if we have to, if one's gone, and yeah. it's evolved into around the table, what was your takeaway from church, what was your takeaway from youth, yeah. things like that. But either way, we've just stayed really intentional yeah. about finding time to talk about Jesus and the Word yeah. and praying together. And as they get older, we've added devotions, and like we're going through Proverbs right now, um, we uh, do individual devotions, there's you versions, there's books, there's uh, there's a whole host of things, and it's not just at night. We do it driving on the road, uh, we've done it on vacation. Uh, well, tell the story you told earlier about um, the prayer, the heavy prayer for the person that needed a heart and how that worked out. Oh, and yeah. I mean, it, you're teaching your kids not just the ABCs, but the the habits of it. You're living it out in front of them. Yeah. Um, like I said, we would we would do prayer requests, and we've always done that to where we, you know, Nate would come home and be like, hey, you know, let's pray for this person, and let's pray for that person. and From sev- the church, prayer requests from the church. Yeah, from the church, and, and even just families that we knew. And several years ago, there was a young lady who attended church here, and she was on the waiting list for a heart. And Emma was really young, and we kept praying for her, kept praying for her, and Emma would pray for her, and I can still remember the night that we learned that she was getting a heart. It was late. Like, we got the text. and Yeah, and Emma was already in bed, and I got to go in and tell her that she was getting a heart. And it was just super exciting for us to be able to share that moment with, with Emma to where she had been praying for Lana. And um, it was really cool. It was really neat. to watch your kids get the vision of it's what you said last week babe the selflessness the service the not to overwhelm them that there's people at church that need hearts and that are lost a baby and you know but to we're the body of Christ Lana's Lana's ours she's our family and um, they get that picture they get that burden um, and I think that really set a precedence with our kids on how they, sorry, how they um, saw the world through the eyes of of the church, the Christ side of things, the body of Christ. And um, so again, figure out what works for you, but do something um, and then lead by example. Um, Don't like beat them over the head and force them, but heavily encourage them. Um, I I remember uh, Jillian, I used to go in to put her to bed and um, she just liked to stroke my hair, and, and an hour later, Monica would come, and I'd be asleep on the bed, and Jill's playing on the floor. So we, we realized quickly that didn't work. That was not going to fly. So we had to change that one up rather Nate quickly. Nate needed accountability. Yeah, I needed accountability. Um, but I don't know if she did it intentionally, but she was having the time of her life. And it's, it's really, it's kind of neat the way that it's evolved, and I don't think we kind of did, but kind of didn't set out to where... We want them to be praying on their own. We want them, okay, if mom and dad aren't home, you guys can still that's, yeah, pray. That's you can again. still seek Jesus. And um, even if we don't have our set time, we've built this thing. We've you know, created this foundation for you that yeah. hopefully gives them a really good launching pad. Yeah. And, and, and I'm telling you, probably most weeks we hit a good six out of seven days, but many weeks it was four days. Uh, again, not the perfect family. Like you come home late and you're like, you know, singing and praying, we'll do that tomorrow night, right? Yeah. You know, that's that's just the flesh. That's just the human side. Uh, this one, I love this question because I've just seen a lot of 
wonky answers to this question in the church. What does submission really mean? What should it look like to properly reflect God's design? As a wife, how do I submit slash follow if I completely, in capital letters, completely disagree with what he says? <laughs> Actually, somebody put in the parentheses from Monica Sweeney, but I know that wasn't true. <laughs> Tedder, whoever had those no, letters. <laughs> so uh, it's interesting why... Um, in my experience with this, again, there's this evangelical church mindset that when we talk about submission, the only place we go is, is women submitting to men and wives submitting to husbands. And um, we teach at Catalyst the whole counsel of the Word of God. Uh, Ephesians 4, in the context leading into where it talks about husbands and wives and wives submitting, it talks about, therefore, as the body of Christ, submit one to another in the fear of the Lord. See, we're all under submission in many areas of our life. We're in submission to God first and to governments and to legislation, right? And then we're submitted, we're supposed to be submitted to church elders and not just elders in church leadership, but older than us. The Bible tells us to submit to our elders. Hey, they're a little wiser, they're a little older. You know that guy that you're making fun of because he's wearing the funky hat and he's got the white socks and sandals? He fought in World War II and he saved 20 lives. I mean, these are heroes that... that this is an elder. You should honor and submit to them, not because they're perfect, but because they have some things figured out that they could teach you. And if you'll, as a young person, you know, shut your mouth for a little while and, and honor them, you will learn oodles and loads of things from people who have done it, probably better than you're doing it, if that makes sense. And so the question is, in what areas am I called to submit, and am I doing that? Because in Ephesians, where most people go to, and, and I know they look at Titus and Timothy, different places... But in Ephesians specifically, it gives a long list of what the men's responsibility is and a short list of what the wife's responsibility is. And we got men telling their wives to submit. That's unbiblical. God does not call you to tell you or teach your wife to submit. He tells you to love your wife as Christ loves the church, which is selfless, which is sacrificial, which is laying down your wants and desires. So in our marriage, it's funny, we've even had the kids ask us over the years, why do you prefer mom in so many things? Where we eat and where we go on vacation and just day to day and where the couch sits. And I, we know you have opinions. Like one person, that one of them asked me one time, do you not have an opinion on that? And I said, look who you're talking to. Like I have an opinion on everything. But why would I choose to fight those small battles when I can simply prefer her as Christ loves me in the church, I can prefer her. I had a guy tell me a while back that uh, as long as he can remember, unless he's out of town or has to be at work early, every day he gets up and he has his, his wife's coffee made the way she wants it, and he brings it to her. She's a slow waker upper. He's a little faster waker upper. And he's told that story, and other men have said, why would you do that? Like, like are you expecting to get something out of that? And, what it, and he said, because I can I can serve my wife. It is a simple little thing like that. Why wouldn't I? And so in our marriage, you know, Monica, one of the, we had a table at the men's retreat this weekend, and we determined at our table that all of our wives should get much bigger crowns with a lot more jewels in them because of having to put up with us, right? The five guys at our table, right? And so Monica puts up with a lot for me as a man and the way that I do things. And, and so I will serve her and honor her and prefer her as much as I can so that when it comes time for the submission conversation, it's easy for her. And that's not my, me saying that. I'm going to let her speak to that. But I want to make it as easy as possible. If I'm submitting to God and the Holy Spirit, I'm submitting to the elders at Catalyst. I'm submitting this weekend at the men's retreat. I submitted to the men's leadership team. What do you guys need from me? I'm here not as Pastor Nate. I'm here as Nate. And so I'm submitting to you guys. What do you need from me? So if I'm submitting, the Holy Spirit's going to show up in that conversation and the other person submits, then that's a beautiful picture. First of all, no. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you. Um, so the Bible doesn't tell women to submit to men. That's right. It tells wives to submit to husbands. And that's a really important distinction because your husband's not going to love me the way my husband loves me. We have a covenant. And so... When he's serving God and he's doing all those things that it talks about that a husband is supposed to do, he's in covenant with God and he's in covenant with me. And so how he treats me is going to be a lot different than how any other man treats me. We don't have that kind of intimacy. I don't have that intimacy with anyone else. Mm -hmm. And so it's a different, it's different. We're submitted to one another. And that wouldn't even work 
in so many areas that wouldn't work if that was what it said for yeah. women to submit to men. Um, but as he said, when he, was, when he was younger, his mom told him, Nate, if you can just love your wife the way she needs to be loved, she'll do anything for you. And I feel like with Nate, that was something that he took very seriously. He took it to heart, and he's done a really good job of loving me well. And because of that, whenever there are things that I completely disagree with him and I think that he's missing it, I submit anyway. If it's not, if it's not unbiblical, yeah, that's and the make key. sure that you know you understand, I'm not going to submit to something that the Bible says I don't have to. Yeah, I submit to God power, first. Yeah, the higher power. And even in submitting to my husband, I'm not submitting to Nate. I'm submitting to Christ. Mm-hmm. And the reason why it's easy for me to submit to Nate is because he loves Jesus. He's seeking Jesus and he's abiding with Christ. And that's what I'm actually submitting to. I'm not submitting to Nate, the man who's got it all perfectly figured out and he's doing everything perfect. I'm submitting to Christ. Yeah, that's good. And I know that he's going to have to answer. He's going to have to give an account. If he leads us in a selfish way and he leads us you know, astray because he's being selfish, He's going to answer to God for that, and I'm going to answer to God for how I submit yeah, to Him. Um, but when when a wife feels safe, husbands, you'll be amazed at what she will do for you. When a wife feels safe, and when she feels taken care of, and when a wife feels like you are putting her first, and you're putting your family first, and you give her something to submit to, you'd be shocked. There's nowhere I wouldn't go with Nate. I have. We've picked up and moved a couple of times, and I'd do it again if he felt like that's what God was calling us to do because he's consistently putting his family first. And that's really what, what a wife is looking for is to feel, to feel safe, to know that you're going to take care of her. Yeah, so good. And knowing that I'm under submission to God and to other men, that's what you've told me before. I have accountability bro- par- partners. I also have elders at the church that if I get out of line, they'll, they'll, you know, so there's that as well, the accountability of the body that you mentioned last week. And there's a freedom, <clears throat> there's a freedom in that for me and knowing when, a, when Nate is pursuing Jesus and pursuing me and taking care of me yeah. that I can submit to him. That, and there's a, well, there's a freedom in that, just like there's a freedom in submitting to, to Christ. Yeah. Uh, one thing we teach on this, we teach a class called Beta Satan, and, and one of the key things in that is submission does not begin until there's a disagreement. Just write that down and let that mull over that. Oh, I'm submitted to the elders at church. Oh, we spent money on a church band? Well, I don't like that. I'm going to Grace Point. Mm-hmm. You know what? Guess what? They spent money on a church band too. But here's the thing. Submission doesn't begin until there's a disagreement. And so you have to determine, oh, I've had wives tell me I submit to my husband, and then they end up in my office, and then it's, well, you know, it's why are we struggling? Well, I disagree with them. Well, that's where, this, that's where submission actually begins. And so I think that's just, um, there's, there's a lot to that. Yeah, and, and definitely here, like, <laughs> I submit to him, but that doesn't mean that I don't fight with him. Oh, yeah, well, yeah. Ooh. Like, yeah. I'm not going down without a fight. Matter of fact, when she doesn't fight, I'm like, what's going on? Because, like, yeah. we're fight, we fight. Like, we're fighters, and we fight good. We fight healthy. We're both opinionated. Yeah. Like, I know he said that, but... I mean, we're definitely are both are like, you're just going to have to convince me. And so I, I, I say that I submit, but please don't, don't put me on a pedestal and think that, oh, she always submits perfectly. It's not no. like that. Well, there's probably all. five things in our 22 years of marriage that I've literally said, okay, I feel A, you feel B, and we're going with A. Mm-hmm. Because we fight it out. We think, oh, I see what you're saying. You know right. what? Yeah, that's a good idea. You're smarter than me, right? We'll go with that. Yeah. So I, I, it is a bigger conversation. Absolutely. Uh, I'm going to jump down to some of these because they're second service specific. Um, one person followed up on the same sex. If we stand heavy on same sex marriage, what about sexually active heterosexual couples before marriage? You said six months separation is asked, but is it a requirement to support the marriage or supporting marriage of non believers? Uh, that's if, if I'm going to marry somebody, I'm not just going to. A lot of pastors say, hey, they're trying to make the right choice. Just go ahead and marry them and put a stamp on what they're doing. And I'm like, that's just covering up. There's a lot of. Why are they? Why are they doing what they're doing? Why? You know, now, if they're non-believers and they're coming together and they want, I think that's a great example. But 
we absolutely tell us there are people that we that are in leadership here that, that have uh, over the years you know got, gone into those types of relationships same sex heterosexual and you're sleeping around and we've pulled them from leadership and we've said no this is not okay shocking to me there's other pastors that well they're good leaders and they're trying to figure it out no 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 we're going to have this it, pornea is pornea we're going to work across the board it's not shaming in any way it's saying there's biblical principles and biblical standards just like if somebody we found out was uh, not taking care of his family. That's abusive. If you're not taking care of your family and you're leading at the church, we're going to ask you to step down because we want to care for you and get your family the first area of leadership right first. And so uh, sexuality just is one that just becomes, I've just been dumbfounded how blind people can be to pornography and heterosexual, but just call homosexuality just the abominable sin. No, we look at it all as pornea and we deal with it accordingly. So I hope that answers that. Uh, a follow-up question to um, the husband, the father, where the wife is trying to lean into her faith and learn to pray, but he's losing his faith. I assume that's a follow-up. Um, can you speak to the husband, the father, or the family? Um, again, I, if you're here, if you're the husband and you're here, uh, we are not a church that, that disavows you because you're challenging your faith. That is actually, we wish more Christians would have the uh, analytical you know, mindset to say, I believe, but help my unbelief. Like argue with us, wrestle with, wrestle with your faith because you're banking your eternal salvation. And there's actually a, seg- a session we're going to do in um, Did God Really Say? And it talks about is God anti-science? And what about this anti-intellectualism in the church? I taught about that last year, remember? No, it's not just blind faith. Scott spoke to that two Sundays ago. It, there's a, there's a, a, an analytical side to faith and a learning. So uh, that husband or that father, show up, meet with me, meet with one of the elders, meet with one of the deacons. Let's, let's see what that looks like for you. But the, I think the biggest mistake you could make is to pull out, is to pull away and to say, okay, she's, she's doing it. She's fine. You know, I'm going to let her take the kids to church. Even if you're wrestling with your faith, keep showing up, if that makes sense, because you're trying to do this together and you're trying to, you want to support her. You want to encourage her, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, being healthy. Somebody asked about being healthily, emotionally healthy for my grandkids. And I love that. We see so many situations where grandparents aren't involved in grandkids with grandkids, but we also see today a lot of grandparents raising grandkids. Um, And so absolutely uh, a lot of generations uh, above me, two generations before me, emotional health was never talked about. Guys don't talk about their emotions. It's just not a thing. So you may have grown up culturally in a very emotionally dysfunctional environment. I would absolutely dive into that because you want to not just spoil your grandkids. You want to love them and you want to, you want to come behind the parents and encourage them, if that makes sense. So I think absolutely, we're doing a class this fall about becoming emotionally healthy. Sign up for that. You know, Dive into some of those books we've, we've offered during that emotional health uh, series we did last year, The Soul One. Did you have anything to that one? Yeah, that actually uh, was a big reason why I started seeing a therapist. I want to be emotionally healthy yeah, for my kids and my grandkids. I wanted to um, address some of the generational things that I'd noticed, um, some things from my childhood that I hadn't taken care of, and they were kind of manifesting themselves with, with my kids. And I'm like, I don't want to keep that going. I, I want to take care of this and figure this out. I don't want to pass that on to um, my kids and grandkids. So seek help. Get get some get some yeah. opinions on that. Amen. Yeah. Uh, my question is how to help deal with a parent who's dealing with the PTSD and balancing the health of your marriage and your mental health. My question is how to ensure your marriage is health while dealing with a bad season, uh, quote unquote, bad season. Uh, number one, PTSD, I don't care uh, what area of PTSD we're talking about, military or childhood trauma or you know, whatever. It is a very real thing. It's not just psychobabble. It's scientifically proven. It's, it's biologically proven nowadays. There's so much science behind this. It is an extremely real thing. It's not just pray the demons out of them. That's what I was raised. We can just pray the demons out. You know, if, if there are demons, we'll be happy to pray the demons out, but it's a bigger picture. So thank you for asking that question. It's the whole mental health question Monica's brought up for years. If I got cancer, everybody celebrates. We're going to do a 5K and raise money. If you say I'm struggling with mental health, we say put them in the corner and hopefully they go to another church, right? No, mental health is, is it's a health conversation. And so uh, number one, I would say dive into community. Please let your leadership know because we want to know. We've had scenarios in the past where people are dealing with mental health struggles and or PTSD, 
and we were invited in and a person would act out in a catalyst group or they'd act out in a Sunday morning and it's like very concerning and should we call the police? Should we? No, no, no. We know what's going on. We can now approach that person with grace, with truth. We can get the right people who have the right training that actually have the relationship with them. Many times, if they have someone they've already met with and they're comfortable with, we can ask that person to go, hey, someone's having an issue. We, can you walk them outside? Let's just pray with them, talk with them. And man, because they see a safe place. When you're in, in a traumatic reminder, PTSD moment, like you don't know up from down, back from front sometimes. And so getting a safe place helps those people get grounded. So please talk to us. We have kids where the parents will come into kid men with these issues. And when the parents don't talk to us about it, all we know is a kid's acting out. But when they sit down with our kid men leaders and we say, hey, our kid's got this, we actually will partner the right people with your child while he's here or she's on campus to help man, uh, manage that while they're here, to love on them, to encourage them, to get the right resources. Uh, we do not want you to go through it. Please don't go through the bad season alone. Please. Oh my God, please don't do that because we see, we've seen literal people walk away from families and commit suicide and just it's dark because they never entered into biblical community. And as Monica so eloquently shared last week, if you hurt, we hurt. You're the body of Christ. So please have those conversations and know that we're gonna do whatever we can to help you uh, in those areas. So you have anything to that one? Okay. How do you deal with the split family with no or difficult communication between the other household doesn't take or partake in church? Uh, that is so difficult and it is so um, specific to that, to your situation. Uh, number one, build bridges, do whatever you can. Um, uh, try to um, see where they're coming from. Uh, many times we had a question that I didn't get to, but um, a, a believing spouse and an unbelieving spouse and parenting styles. Many times when somebody's a Christian um, and someone's not a Christian, there is an immediate, they think they're Bible thumpers and they, they think that you're better than, that you're trying to say that you're better than them and you're judgmental. And, and so if you can you know, minimize that in any way you can, try to sit down and have the partnering conversations. We actually have a step family ministry here with a couple of our deacons, Ryan and Tressa. They would they would love to sit with you. They work with couples. Uh, they use a lot of resources, but they've also been through a lot with a lot of families. Reach out to the office. We can get you set up with them because really building that trust, and we have seen some really conflicted step family situations not be perfect, but get much more civil. And it's still a non-believing and it's a believing. You've got a Christian family and a non-Christian. Um, you know, having those markers, you know, even talking to the kid about it's okay to challenge your faith. You know, we're not all demons on this side and they're not all demons on that side conversation. So uh, do you have any thoughts around that? Because we've worked with plenty of blended families. Yeah, I think, uh, I think you put it well. Just uh, walk with grace, walk with respect towards anyone who, um, who believes differently than you and, and, or even believes the same as you, but, you know, just walks it out differently. Have respect because you're, you're not going to, get anywhere if you're disrespectful to one yeah. another um, or hateful to each other. Try, especially in a blended family, try to put personal issues aside for your kid's sake. Remember, number one, it's all about Jesus and we represent him. Yeah. And then second, kids are kids and we're there to advocate for them. We don't act like children ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah we have one family we worked with years ago that, um, they had a safe group of people to vent to, to pray with, and to talk with. But then when they went back, they actually, they actually took the low road in the sense of they gave a lot in the relationship, knowing that I'm representing Christ. And so the family would say, well, I want this extra weekend. And, I want, and legally, they didn't have to. But they said, you know what? Because we love you and we love the kid, we're going we're gonna to go with that. And over the years, it balanced out to where they have a great working relationship today but you see, again, we're the Christians. We should have the love, joy, peace, long suffering, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, self control. We should have a different response than the non Christian. And the scripture talks about how we can actually win people over by just the way that we conduct ourselves because we're salt and we're light. And so I'm going to call Daniel and the team to close out in worship. But we had one more question. Well, we had a lot more questions. But if we didn't get to your question and you want to reach out to uh, a leader, we'd love to still talk with you. But one of the questions was, how do I find joy 
in the mundane, Monica talked about last week, the laundry, the, the, the quote was the laundry, the kids, the school, the schedules. And so I'd love to hear you speak to that and then I can speak my two cents. Well, I'm it's actually three cents because of inflation, right? I'm it's so glad you said that because I saw that question and we didn't get to it in first service. And um, I thought, man, I really want to answer that question because I get, I get it. I've been a stay-at-home mom for almost 20 years now. and um, you, you hardly stay home. You guys are on the run. And <laughs> right. Um, make the joy. The laundry's going to be there. The dishes are going to be there. The homework's going to be there. Um, your kids are going to grow up really fast. Life is going to go by really fast. Just go find the joy. Do the things that... Um, that bring you joy. And if the laundry doesn't get done that day or you have to order pizza for dinner, just do it. Like there's a bigger picture here yeah. than perfect, than running a perfect house home. Do the things you enjoy. Go to the creek, go under the water and get your hair wet. <laughs> Thursday night. <laughs> yeah. Just go do those things. Just go find the joy. Yeah. And and I would say I am the ble most blessed husband man in the world to have Monica as my wife she's taught me so much on that principle because I'm a doer and I'm a do it with nobody's help I can just get it done I, I'm a bulldozer just get it done and she, she's so good early on just invite Emma into that take Emma with you bring Jillian along like literally folding laundry became games like she makes every one of our kids from day one I mean as, as when they could help you're chopping the onions while I'm cooking and there's dialogue and there's laughing and there's funny stuff happening to where now they all know how to cook. They all know how to prepare meals. But she saw a vision that I didn't see. I'm like, they're spilling on the floor and it's taking a lot of time and I'm efficient. And she's like, dude, teach him how chill. to sleep. Yeah, she's, she's like, chill out, man. If, it, if dinner's a little later, you can have a snack. Man. Just make it joyful. And she's so good about that. Even just, hey, we're going to have dinner late tonight because I just took the kids to the park and I'm like, I'm hungry. I've been working all day. And she's like, it's going to be okay, sweetie. There's snacks. And so even helping me see those things, make it joyful because you can. I'm, I'm the grump. I can make it not joyful and I can shut everybody down or I can come in and say, how can I help and be a part? And so be that joy, make the joy. Uh, I think that there's, there's so many other questions, but uh, we're just going to close it out and pray for you guys. Stand with us. Uh, Daniel's going to uh, lead us in worship on the way out, but I want to pray over the families. Many of you have reached out and told us that you are fasting. We asked you guys to fast between Mother's Day and Father's Day. When you fast a meal, you take that same time and you apply it to Word of God, study and prayer or worship. Uh, if you fast the screen, you take that same time you were going to watch that show and you apply it to the Word and prayer and worship. And so uh, I heard four or five men approach me at the men's retreat last this, yesterday and said, hey, our family's fasting and we're already seeing God do things in our family because we shut off the screens. And so we encourage all of you to jump on board. But the whole point of that is our families are under assault. The nuclear family is under attack and we want families to be healthy. So we're gonna pray right now for all of our families at Catalyst Church. Lord, we lift up our families. We link shields with uh, those that are single, that are parenting, that are grandparenting, that are in, in step families and foster and adoptive. And Lord, from everywhere in between, you are a God of family and you are a God of legacy and you are a God of love and encouragement. And uh, even in the midst of our dysfunction, you visit us with your presence and your grace. So we pray against the assaults of the enemy and we say, Lord, raise up a standard against the attacks of the enemy on our families. Lord, as we are fasting in this season, uh, that we will see you do some amazing things. There are prodigals that will return. There are those that are not, that are apathetic to you that are going to get fired up for the things of God. They're going to be woke up to righteousness. Lord, there are those that are struggling and wrestling with painful things that you're going to bring healing and deliverance. And those that are wrestling with painful things that you're going to give them grace to walk through. Uh, rather than heal it right now, you're going to show them there's a bigger picture of what I'm doing. So I'm going to grace you to stay in that season. And you're going to see the glory of God in the midst of it because you do work out all things for your glory and our good. And we thank you for Catalyst and Biblical Community and this, the healthy families that you're producing because we're abiding in you and we're trusting you. And we close this out, Lord, with vertically driven worship to, to give you the honor that's due you in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Pray this with us. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, not be all else to me, say that 
Thou art, Thou my best thought, by day or by night. Waking or sleeping, Thy presence, my vision, Father, your vision, your wisdom, your understanding, your guidance as we tackle these questions and the ones we have according to your word and by the power of your spirit. And God, even the line, riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise, I pray that that would be the, uh, the line, the truth that, uh, that moves us to give uh, today. Thank you for being our provider in all things and the, and the call to, to give and, and entrust back to you uh, some of what you've given to us through our tithe and offering today. So we bless you, we worship through our giving, and we're grateful uh, for how you even provide uh, for, for your creation through the rain that's pouring right now. Um, God, we're just grateful for so much. Uh, so we give you all the praise and all the glory in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hey, stay dry out there maybe, uh, and uh, have a great day, great week. <laughs>